Welcome to Pharma Docs with your hosts, myself, Dr. Jay Resnick, and Dr. John Robertson. Practicing oral surgeons bring you the latest and greatest in pharmacology as it affects you in your daily dental practice. All right, John. Jay. Welcome back. Hey, hey, good yeah. evening from yeah. Hattiesburg. How, yeah, you how doing, are you things there? Good. It's a Man. little hot today, but at least it's not humid. 94 here, buddy. Okay. We had nine, 92, I think, but it was and, only 33% humidity. Yeah, but we have 100%. You walk out and you're just dripping wet yeah. with sweat, man. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, uh so we're, we're here in June, July, August, September, the dog days of summer. They're here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It just gets brutal. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I've been in the South in the summer. <laughs> it definitely does. <laughs> man, uh, how, how, everything good? Yeah, everything's great. Yeah, we're uh, we're busy in the office. Family's good. Um, dogs are good. You know what else can what else can you ask for, right? Uh, likewise, and uh, man, I just got back from a uh, surgery mission trip in Honduras, and oh, yeah? man, not only was it great, it was just soul cleansing and mm -hmm. uh, just awesome to to, yeah. to help so many people. Yeah, I did something like that in Guatemala, probably six, seven years ago. And it was, it was great. I mean, it was really, and, and you, and you meet people that you become friends with. Oh, absolutely. Uh, when you do that, you know, when you spend a week media. together. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we had a team of about 30 people and, uh, it was just incredible. Like you said, you got there at first strangers and trying to get to know everybody. And then, yeah, uh, you know, within a couple of days, you know, everything about them. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> then all of a sudden the trip's coming to an end. Nobody right. wants to go home. You know? Exactly. Exactly. So everybody's Good. already looking forward to next year as well, too. And so Great. I, I well, encourage all of our listeners, if you can do something like that, please do, um, uh, uh, Sounds good. I, I promise you, you're going to feel better yeah, when you give. De definitely. It really, it really does. Uh, when you make a difference, it really does make a difference in your life. All right. So Jay on pharma docs, I, I, I've got, I got a, a e blast just the other day and it talked about a cluster of first approvals mm -hmm. that were dominating the FDA in May of 2022. All right. So let, let me read this out to you before we get into the show. Okay. okay. This, this is, this is fascinating. Dupixent is the first treatment granted for eosinophilic esophagitis. Okay. Oh, really? Then the first in-class agent Vatama, and we'll talk mm -hmm. about that for plaque psoriasis. Yeah. And then Manjaro is a weekly auto injector for type two diabetes. Yeah, we're going to talk about that one too. That's right. Then Voquesna contains a novel acid blocker to treat H. pylori infection. We talked about that last yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Then in her two is used for expanded use in breast cancer treatment. And then intravenous T pox, which you can imagine is clear for smallpox disease. Yeah. And then finally Falnetra, is now the fifth biosimilar to new Lesta. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll talk about that tonight too. So yeah, that's, these, exactly, that's the first one we're going to talk about. These are some of the first, right. As far as first, first in class. Yeah, that's right. First in class. And this is something we have been talking about the entire time with pharma docs is yeah. uh, how many new drugs are coming to market. Yeah that are first line therapy for this specific disease yeah. state. And they're not just, you know, another drug in a class that's been used for a while. They're completely new, like I said, first in class drugs that nothing like that, uh, like those drugs exists. And it, it approaches the disease treatment from a, a new aspect and from a new position. And, you know, the, the, um, it can be life changing. Well, like just last time we talked about, you know, various different drugs, uh, the treatment in the past, maybe have been some steroids or something like yeah. that. Now For a lot they of things, a, yeah. That's right. They have a specific drug that targets the cellular activity of that disease state. Right. It's yep. just going to get better, Jay. I'm just, yeah. I'm just telling you. I know. So, I mean, the like, number of drugs coming out now is just mind boggling. Well, not only mind boggling, but I'm sorry if you're watching us tonight, um, it's going to be mind boggling to you as well, because uh, as my partner on this show has said, if you got out 10 years ago and there's 
averaging 55 drugs a year, that's 550 new drugs. Mm -hmm. All right. What, what do I need to do to alter my treatment? Do I yeah. need to give this patient um, some antibiotics beforehand or afterhand? Do I need a, a, a physician consultation before I treat this patient as well too? Yeah. So uh, what kind of modification do you have to do as far as treatment planning for this patient? Right. So you got to keep up with pharmacology, mm -hmm. period. Exact, exactly. Because if, if patients on a drug uh, or has a disease, um, they very well may be on a drug that will affect your treatment, something that affects their uh, resistance to infection or their ability to heal. And you've got to be, you've got to be aware of them. So w with that in do right there, let's just jump right on in. Cause you said, you know, to treat infections. Um, uh, let's talk about Phil Netra, which I okay. just mentioned right there, which is pick Phil Grestram, which is and a, a dash dash P B B K, which injection. means nothing, which, which actually, yeah, it's the random letters, but what does random it mean? Letters. It means that it's, this is a biosimilar, sim, biosimilar, biosimilar to an existing drug, uh, that being new Lasta, which is peg field And, uh, it's basically a, being a biosimilar, it has the same effects and really is no different or is minimally different just maybe a little bit different structure or some different molecules, uh, but without affecting how it works. And this is a uh, leukocyte growth factor right. that um, uh, is a, a granulocyte colony simulating factor, GCSF uh, uh, activator. And what it does is it's indicated for patients who um, have neutropenia after chemotherapy. So, it, all right. So uh, right now our, our audience, I mean, we, we, we were trained to this in dental school, but what, what exactly is neutropenia? And that's a condition that causes you to have a low number of neutrophils right. in your blood. And so neutrophils are white blood cells that are made in the bone marrow and they ha help us fight infection and right. bacteria, Jay. Yeah. And about 50% of cancer patients who are going through chemotherapy develop neutropenia. So this is, this is not an uncommon uh, situation. And that's, you know, this is one of the risks uh, when we put people through chemotherapy for ke treating their cancers is they could succumb to an infection uh, because they have made sometimes uh, in some cases a very severe neutropenia. And so one of the first drugs that came along to treat this um, was um, Neupogen, which is yes. uh, Filgrastim. And this, this new drug is uh, Pegfilgrastim. So PBBK. That, yeah, PBBK. And um, so uh, this, this is a, a new drug in the same class. Um, so it's a biosimilar. And it really does make a difference. It basically attenuates the drop in white blood cell count that occurs with chemotherapy. They generally, uh, generally the uh, white blood cell count uh, hits its nadir about 10 to 14 days after the chemotherapy is given. And it takes about three, four weeks to get back to normal levels before they have basically another round of chemotherapy. And so uh, with this drug, this drug is given uh, the day after chemotherapy. It's an injection and it works very well to prevent the uh, neutropenia from occurring. Or if, it, you know, if they do have neutropenia, it's not it's more in the mild category than than severe. Right. So when that patient comes in, Jay, and we're talking to them, we know they've undergone chemotherapy. Okay. And we know right. we got to treat them. They may have a bad tooth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, all right. What are some of the questions we need to be asking our patients about, okay, what are your neutropenia levels or your neutrophil levels? Right. You know, like, you know, normal is going to be about 2000 to 7,000 per millimeter right. uh, or per cubic right. millimeter of blood. So, yeah. Is there such a thing as mild neutropenia or moderate, or could it be severe, or could it be all of the above? Yeah, and and basically mild is less than 1,500, but more than 1,000. And right. then in that 500 to 1,000 range is moderate. And a neutrophil count, absolute neutrophil count below, 50, or below 500, rather, is uh, in the severe category. And uh, so when you have patients who are going through chemotherapy, which is not an uncommon thing, um, you want to ask them, um, are they following their white blood cell count? Are they taking any medications or getting any injections right. to help counteract the neutropenia? And of course you want to, 
if you can, if you're doing any elective treatment, you want to make sure it's when their white blood cell count is the highest. Now, if you're seeing them for an emergency, um, that's a different story because if they're neutropenic and they've got a dental infection um, and you don't treat the dental infection, uh, that can certainly be life-threatening for them. And Absolutely. so, and so you've got to, you've got to know that it, it's okay to jump in there and treat the patient. You're going to, of course, call the patient's oncologist and discuss this with them. But, um, you know, we're providing a very valuable, uh, service by managing patients that have dental infection who, who might have neutropenia during chemotherapy. So another way, if we go back to when we were thinking about congestive heart failure, the various stages. Yeah. So we go from A to D. So D is the worst stage there. So with the, the neutrophil count, Jay, the lower we go, the greater the risk of infection. Yeah. All right. So mild, moderate, severe. So when you're under 500 and that patient does have a, a, a dental abscess, they must be treated. Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, Cause I mean, this patient is prone to significant infection now with their neutrophils below that level. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be bacterial infection from any source, not necessarily a tooth. It can be from strep throat. It can be even fungal when they're, when they're in the severe category. So, so, so one thing I, I like to do too, Jay, is when they come in is check that uh, temperature as well too, mm -hmm. because um, they, they, you know, any fever must be taken very serious yeah. along with this low A and C. And so you, you're probably going to be in touch with their oncologist yeah, or for sure. hematologist. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. But trust me, these physicians want to hear from you no matter what time of day or night. Right. Uh, yeah. with these patients as well too. They should, they sure do. That's absolutely correct. Um, sorry, so some of the side effects, um, it's right. pretty common to have bone pain and extremity pain, uh, with Filmetra, yes. um, and the other, and the other bi biosimilars, but, um, it can actually lead to splenic rupture, uh, acute respiratory dist distress syndrome, uh, serious allergic reactions and, uh, glomerulonephritis and even sickle cell disease in, uh, the, or sickle cell crisis in those who are susceptible. And, uh, you know, this is, Filnetra is, is the fifth FDA approved peg filgrastum biosimilar um, that's been approved le uh, lately. Uh, one of them is, or the other four are, ni let's see, niv Nivapria, ZX Tento, Udenica, and Fulfilia, or Ful Fulfilla. So those are some other biosimilar drugs uh, to Nulastin. And you're probably going to see those uh, in your patients too. So Nupagen, Filgrastum, Zarcio, Nivestum, and Reluco. Mm. Um, those are drugs you need to know when that patient comes into your office, Jay. Period. Yep. All right. Yep. Um, you got to know yeah. them or you got to know where to look them up. Yeah. Um, I think you have I've somebody you that has an, a, a, a suppressed immune system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That's for sure. And like I said, if you don't know what, what the drug is, it's very easy to look up. Um, you can use uh, Medscape, Hippocrates, even you know Google it and get the information that you need. So when you go in and see your patient, uh, you are educated on the medications they're taking. Um, you know, they taught us in medical school um, that you can't know everything. It's no. impossible for you to know everything. But one of the key things we're going to teach you in medical school is knowing how to look up and get the answer. Well, you don't, you can't even, you, you won't know everything, nor can you keep up with everything. No, it's all just right? too much. You're probably about two years behind in everything. Mm -hmm. All right. There's just so much information out there. Yeah. All right. Definitely. And, it, definitely. and, and it's tough to stay current and you got to mm -hmm. do everything you can because um, you, you, you can't slack in that area. Yeah. So sure. uh, let's, let's move in that other drug, Vitama. Vitama, I, yeah. I talked about earlier being another one of those first approvals. Mm -hmm. And um, what, it's a, what's that used for, Jay? It, it's a cream that's used to treat, a topical cream that's used to treat plaque psoriasis. And it's a first in class aryl hydrocarbon uh, receptor <laughs> modulating agent. Um, so I what is those names? Huh? So what, what light bulb goes off? This is not a steroid. This is not a topical steroid. It's a, yeah. it's a brand new first in class topical for treating um, uh, plaque psoriasis. And plaque steroid psoriasis, free. Steroid free. 
plaque psoriasis. And that, you know, by the way, you, know, you have a patient who's on topical steroids, they can have some suppression of their immune system. Yes. So you want to be careful with those patients too. Don't just think because it's topical um, that they can't get immune suppression. But it's for, so plaque psoriasis is the most common form of psoriasis, probably about 90% of the time. And essentially what happens is it's like an auto, basically an autoimmune response to some minor trauma. And the, the skin cells just go kind of go haywire yes. and they start multiplying up to 10 times their normal rate. And when they, when they multiply that fast, of course, the cells don't come out normal. Um, and so you get these raised red plaques um, that can be seen um, in many parts of the body, like on the, on the elbows and the knees, on the back, um, on the arms. And these plaques are covered with scales, which are desquam desquamated um, epithelial cells, all, you know, keratinized. And so um, this is, you know, this is a, a great new treatment. Um, you know, psoriasis usually occurs in early adulthood and it does go through uh, some, some uh, exacerbations and remittances. Uh, for the most part, it is not transmissible from person to person. So you can't catch it from someone, but it can be, right. it can run in families. And right. yeah. And the, the name for plaque psoriasis, because it's the most common is uh, psoriasis vulgaris. And of course we all know that vulgaris means common. The right. actual, the Latin root of it means common, which is interesting that the word vulgar initially meant common. <laughs> in English, in the English language. And I did a little research on it because like, how did vulgar become, you know, kind of a, a, a synonym for uh, basically for bad speech for, um, you know, for uh, uh, language that is not acceptable? Well, it turns out that um, uh, vulgarism turns out to be the opposite of vulgar. And what that means is something that's not socially acceptable. And so in uh, turn of the century England, if something what had was a uh, vulgarism, uh, then it was, then it was not correct speech. It was actually, it was actually, if you weren't refined, if you weren't educated and you, sw you came from a poor area where you didn't use proper English, that was vulgarism. And Amazing. then that kind of became vulgar. And uh, so that's that's where that's how uh, vulgar came from meaning common to meaning uh, something completely different. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Now, since we learned about vulgarism, I'm going to get you get us back on to cytokines. And, okay. uh, <laughs> and uh, th th so small proteins, Jay, that cause the change in the skin cell. So. Right. And so these yeah, multiple small cytokines. Multiple that, cytokines is what uh, what sets this off. What sets that, off the that, psoriasis. they cause the plaque psoriasis exactly, and, and they're called interleukin twelve, interleukin seventeen, interleukin twenty two, mm -hmm. twenty three, and then TNF, which stands for tumor necrosis factor. Yeah. So and these medications tr treat by blocking these small proteins. Right. Mm -hmm. So yep. the message can't get through to cause the plaque psoriasis yeah, to grow abnormally and cause the psoriasis. Exactly. Um, you know, there's some other conditions that, um, are associated with psoriasis too. Um, conjunctivitis and blepharitis, obesity, yeah. type two diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, as well as other autoimmune diseases like celiac disease and Crohn's disease. And, um, they even mentioned that uh, mental health conditions such as low self-esteem and depression can be seen in patients who have psoriasis. Um, I'm sure this is more likely more common in patients who have really severe psoriasis where it's all over their skin. So most people who have psoriasis, it's, it's limited to some smaller plaques in more discrete areas. Um, but some patients have uh, with real bad psoriasis can have it all over their body. And it's, it's visible to other people and they may be self-conscious about it. Um, another thing that can develop in the patients who have psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis. And that's an inflammatory condition in the joints um, where they have uh, pain and swelling and stiffness in the joints uh, do the same mechanism, this autoimmune mechanism. 
So is there any type of medications, Jay, that may set this plaque psoriasis off in the first place? Um, yeah, actually, um, some, let's see, the medications that set it, set it off are um, some hypertensive drugs. Yes. Uh, lithium can do it. Um, some of the anti-malarial drugs can set it off. And I also uh, read that when I was doing my research that smoking is one of the factors that can uh, exacerbate or lead to psoriasis. And Staphylococcus aureus mm -hmm. or Streptococci Caucus pyogenes as well, yeah. too. Yep, strep pyogenes, exactly. Um, so all kinds of what we think would be a minor insult can set off the immune system to go kind of wacky. That, that, that's amazing. And, you know, last time we talked about a UMAB mm -hmm. that is used to treat plaque psoriasis. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of those drugs are being used just for that. Yeah, uh, Humira, Humira. Uh, which is uh, yeah. adalumumab. Yeah. Um, is used for that. And then there's a newer one called Sky Rizzy. Yes. That, that's uh, all over TV right now. Yeah. Sky Rizzy yeah. is. Yeah, exactly. So again, if you have a patient on psoriasis and it has psoriasis, you want to make sure you know all the medications are on, not just, you know, topical steroids, but also they could be on a monoclonal antibody medication, which will uh, lower their resistance to infection. And so you've got to cover them with antibiotics and, Absolutely. and make sure you do nice, uh, uh, clean uh, surgery or, or dental treatment so that they don't develop an, an infection because they're susceptible, so, more susceptible. So again, Jay, it goes back, they may put on their that uh, initials PP and you might say, okay, no big deal. Keep going. That was plaque psoriasis. Yeah. That's what they meant. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then if uh, you do some type of surgical treatment or invasive treatment and then they don't get better, um that's your fault. Yeah. Right. Because you didn't recognize they were on a UMAB for yep. plaque psoriasis. And so again, it goes back to what we were, we've always said, get deep into the history, ask exactly. those questions. Yeah. There should be no acronyms on your medical history. Write them yeah. out. Let's like IE yeah. infective endocarditis. You got yeah. to know that. Okay? Yeah. No, no sun on stone unturned. You got to find out everything you can about this patient's disease, how severe it is. And again, what medications they're on that could affect your treatment and vice versa. Because there's so many monoclonal antibodies out there now that, you know, like I told you, Jay, my last talk on medical emergency lecture, I got asked about immunosuppressants. Yeah. And yeah, there are more and more coming out all the time. Yeah. I think we've yeah. talked about, I think last time or the time before, I think we talked about, we probably talked about half a dozen new monoclonal antibody drugs in the last yeah. month or two. They are an immunosuppressant, period. Yep. All right. Well, let's Amb move on. Yes. What's our next one? It's another one of those first in line drugs. Yeah. Munjaro or, like yeah, Mount, or Mount Jaro. Mount Jaro. However, you want to, however you want to pronounce it. It's a tirzepatide. Uh, which is also an injection. Yes. And this is a, again, a first in class drug that is actually has two functions. So it, it doesn't just have one mechanism. It actually has two different mechanisms. One is it's an agonist of the glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide GIP receptor, and also of the glucagon like peptide GLP one receptor. It's an agonist of both of those. And what it does, is it improves glycemic control by stimulating insulin secretion uh, by the pancreas. So it's yes. a different mechanism than, uh, than is seen in, uh, or that other diabetes medications for type two diabetes uh, use. And type two diabetes is different than type one. And uh, you know, Jay, the thing about with the GIP and the GLP one, with those, both of those receptors, they, they act, they're a single molecule, but they're a natural incretin hormone in our bodies. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So th that's what they activate right here. And so right. uh, again, this is exciting stuff for those patients that are diabetics. All right. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think the number is staggering. I think we're close to about 60 to 70 million diabetics out there, which yeah. also it, includes pre-diabetes as well. Exactly, exactly. And of course, the difference between type 1 and type 2, or now what's called insulin-dependent and non-insulin-dependent, um, is that with uh, type 1, it's a deficiency of insulin, which allows, the, which creates um, uh, increased sugar in the blood rather so what insulin does is it, it pushes the glucose into cells and out yes. of the bloodstream. 
Um, whereas with type two, it's not a matter of not enough insulin. It's a matter of insulin resistance in the cells. That's right. Yeah. And that's why we see more adults onset diabetes being type two diabetes. Right. Exactly. It's uh, most of the time type one is going to develop uh, when patients are young, but it can occur later in life. Um, right. And, you know, some patients with type two diabetes have severe enough disease that they also need insulin in addition to the other diabetes medications they may be on. But regardless, type one, type two uh, diabetes, they share the common fact that you have high blood sugar levels. It's exactly. Right? And it's, it uses an adjunct to diet uh, and exercise. So it doesn't work on its own, but if you combine it with diet and exercise, um, it gives a, a very significant improvement in the blood sugar levels, kind of normalizes them. Now there, there are lots of diabetes medications. <laughs> um, oh, like, ow. like, yeah. And they, they can be sulfonylureas like glipizide or gliburide, um, which act by causing the pancreas to release more insulin, um, to overcome that insulin resistance by guanides like, um, metformin, which slows down the conversion of carbohydrates into sugar. Um, and then there's medications like actose that, uh, uh, improve the way that that insulin works to get more glucose into the cells, uh, fat cells, liver cells, muscle cells. Um, there are the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, um, which uh, delay the breakdown of carbohydrates. Right. Um, and then some of the newer ones, the DPP4 inhibitors like Genuvia and Trigenta um, cause the pancreas to release more insulin after meals than they would otherwise. And then some of the other new ones are SGLT2 inhibitors, and that's um, your Invocava, Farsiga, and Jardians. Again, medications that are uh, advertised all the time on TV. So there are a lot of, lot of drugs that your patients can be on uh, to treat their diabetes, and, and a lot of times they're on multiple medications. And another one of those situations when you're doing something invasive, you must consider antibiotics. Yeah. In fact, um, I was going to mention, um, you know, when I was in dental school, we learned that, you know, type one diabetics, you have to cover them with antibiotics because they're much more susceptible to infection, but a well-controlled type two diabetic, you don't need to worry about that. But I got to tell you, I've seen some ma major severe infections in well-controlled type two diabetics. So uh, I routinely cover them all with antibiotics. For and, almost and, everything and, I do. And, and, and you know, Jay, and how we diagnose diabetes is by testing the blood glucose levels or sugar levels. Right. And it's typically tested after you fasted overnight. And uh, the, the normal level should be between 70 and 100. Um, uh, but uh, after fasting, your blood glucose level, um, if it's greater than 125, you're, you're basically diagnosed yeah. then yeah. with diabetes. Okay. Exactly. 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 And one thing I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, patients know this number that I'm about to discuss with everybody. One thing, every diabetic walks into my office when we're in our conversation and getting deep into everything. What is your A1C? Jay, mm -hmm. they know it. They spit it yep. right out to me. Yeah, okay? they, they sure do. And um, they'll, they'll say a 6.8 or 7.2. And I'm going to give them a thumbs up. All yeah. right. Then when we start getting in the eights and above, they're getting a thumbs down because yeah. they can get better control of their yeah. diabetes. Exactly. Right? And it's usually from not taking their medications. Correct. And these That's medications good. are great. Yeah, they sure they sure are. All right. Let's move on to our last drug. Yes. Radicava ORS, which is an oral suspension of uh, Daravone which is a medication that's been around since 2017 in the uh, in an injectable form. And this is used for treating uh, ALS. Exactly. I, Amyotrophic lateral, lateral sclerosis. sclerosis. AKA exactly. Lou Gehrig's disease. Exactly. And what this medication does, it's a, a free radical scavenger that um, basically uh, reduces the oxidative effects, uh, oxidative stress on the nerve cell. So in uh, ALS, um, basically what's happening and the name kind of gives it all away. So amyotrophic means no muscle nourishment, amyotrophic. Right. And the reason that comes about and leads to atrophy is that the motor neurons in the lateral aspects of the spinal cord, that's the, that's where the lateral comes right. from, um, be, degenerate and become sclerotic. 
And when they're sclerotic, then obviously they're not transmitting um, normally and not getting that message to the uh, neural end, end plates in the muscle. And so what happens is the muscle can't be controlled. You can't control the muscle movement. And eventually um, you get atrophy of the muscles and it, it can start you know, very subtly um, and then progress sometimes very rapidly. And, you know, this is something that affects about uh, 20,000 uh, new patients every year. Amazing. It's, it's you know, a, Jay, so some of the things that cause ALS, autoimmune, yeah. chemical imbalance, yeah. uh, frequent chemical exposure to like fertilizers and pesticides, yeah. genetics, and of course, infections as well, yeah. too. Yeah, most cases are uh, uh, de novo, but they're about, I think about 5 to 10% um, are familial. And if you've got uh, familial ALS, there's a 50% chance of transmitting that on to your offspring. So well, Jay, that's, that's another great show wrapped up, man. Yeah. Uh, yep. A lot, lot of first in-class drugs. I, I hope everybody appreciates what we're doing here, what we're trying to do to help them in their practice every day. And uh, we're always open yeah. to insight, how to make it better. All yeah, right? we put a lot of work into this. We, we go on to uh, one of the websites and we see all the new drugs that are approved by the FDA. Yes. And we get as much information as we can. Uh, on the drug and also about the disease that it treats so we can uh, we can transfer all that information to you okay till, all right until next time thank next you so time very will much be, oh and next time will be june 23rd yes same time same channel so again 5 p.m on the west coast 8 p.m on the east coast uh in the middle it'll be in the middle <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> on the second and fourth thursday second and fourth thursdays um, and that's, uh, that'll be June 23rd again. So good, good night, everybody. Good night. We Thank will you see, you in, see you in two weeks. Absolutely.